Hi, I'm Mike Wessels. It's my honor to be with you today as part of this important symposium on faith and flourishing. I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to talk, and I wanted to uh, congratulate Dr. McQuiggy on his very inspiring and timely work. I wanted to say a few words today about the importance of community power and uh, problems, their own problem solving and local ownership in addressing issues of children's sexual abuse. You know, we live in a top-down world. Outside experts are oftentimes brought in to diagnose what are the problems of children. And oftentimes they tell communities and parents what they ought to be doing. Uh, and I think that sometimes this approach is useful and, and needed, but it does uh, little to encourage communities to engage in their own creative problem solving and to use their own resilience and their own resources to support children. It also does not unlock community ownership. Oftentimes when a top-down approach is used, communities will say, well, yes, this is a, a project of uh, agency X. And uh, when that project ends, uh, the work uh, and the positive outcomes for children uh, collapse or, or end. So I'm interested in what we can learn from communities about a more sustainable locally owned process in which local people take responsibility and make it their business to uh, uh, prevent problems like child sexual abuse. And this fits with the idea that uh, the real heavy lifters in the child protection arena are not necessarily the social workers and police as important as they are. It is ordinary community people and parents who do the heavy lifting in child protection. So with this in mind, I'd like to share an example from uh, Sierra Leone, where I've had the honor of uh, working uh, with UNICEF, the Ministry of Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, and a, a team of very talented Sierra Leonean people and some wonderful people at the community level in rural communities. And I've been working uh, through uh, an NGO called uh, the Child Resilience Alliance that has been uh, in a support role. The schema that uh, this work follows is there's initial learning, grounded learning about uh, local people's understandings of harms to children. And uh, then that inf the information from that learning is fed back to the community. And then the communities engage in intense dialogue about which of the harms identified uh, they might like to address. And then they engage in uh, planning about how to address their self-selected harm to children. And most importantly, then they engage in actual action uh, to uh, reduce that problem. So in Sierra Leone, uh, pre-Ebola, we began with ethnography in which we had uh, local uh, researchers who were fluent in the local languages and who understood the local context actually live in the communities. Uh, they went with people to their farms, they went to the mosque, they walked with children uh, to school. And as they did this participant observation, they also talked with people and they did interviews and group discussions. And they learned that some of the main problems that local people saw as uh, harming children were uh, teenage pregnancy uh, uh, against children. Secondly, children being out of school. Thirdly, uh, children engaging in heavy work. There were others, but those uh, were really the main three. When David Lamine of UNICEF fed this information back to communities, he asked first, did we hear you correctly? And they responded, yes, yes, uh, those are exactly the problems where uh, we told you and that we're struggling with. And then he sat quietly and created a reflective space. And into that space stepped a number of community members who then asked, what are we going to do about that? So this was a magic moment because they weren't looking to NGOs or to David to solve their problems. They were looking to themselves and they asked, how can we organize ourselves as communities to address these problems. In that moment, uh, we asked whether uh, it might be okay uh, for uh, uh, people like us to walk with them, to accompany them, uh, to serve as co-learners, and to maybe document some of the good things that they did in trying to address 
particular problems uh, that they thought were most important. And they agreed. And so um, the planning process began. And it consisted initially of group dialogues to identify uh, one uh, or uh, two harms to children that the community might want to address. And as you might expect, communities decided to have those dialogues in a plenary discussion with the whole community there. It looked very good, but there were some limitations. Oftentimes it's the community elites that have the greatest voice. Oftentimes there are people who can't go to the meetings. So the facilitator would ask, Is, are all members of the community here and able to speak? And people would uh, confess that, well, there are these uh, families over here that are really very, very poor. They have to work extra jobs and no, they can't come to the meetings. And uh, then the facilitator asked, well, what about girls and women? And the community members would reflect and they'd say, you know, there are some problems that are specific to girls and women that they will not discuss openly in front of men because sometimes men are the problem. And so through this kind of dialogue and awareness raising, community members decided to have small group discussions amongst girls, amongst boys, amongst women and amongst men, with the main themes fed back into the large group discussions, but without any identifiers. And in this way, there was a lot of dialogue about which harm to children um, was most important to address. Ultimately, the communities decided to take on teenage pregnancy. Because, you know, when a young girl becomes uh, pregnant, she faces significant reproductive health issues, uh, issues of maternal mortality. And if she becomes a young mother, typically she drops out of school, the boy drops out of school, so they're both losing their education. And uh, typically the girl's family can't afford to feed another mouth. And that means that the girl has to uh, engage in sex work to help her family survive. So this is really quite a problematic outcome. People were very concerned about it. The president of Sierra Leone had recently at the time uh, an issue, issued uh, a call for everyone to address this very urgent problem of, uh, of teenage pregnancy. So it fit uh, with that wider context. And so next, the community said uh, about developing a plan for ending teenage pregnancy. They had heard that particular NGOs could come and help people learn about puberty and sexual and reproductive health. And so they, uh, they asked for that. And the facilitator then made it possible for them to meet with the NGOs. Capacity building occurred and peer educators were trained who had some expertise on sexual and reproductive health. But there was also uh, engagement uh, with parents and parents wanted to do a lot of dialogues about helping to keep their children in school and helping their children to understand their bodies, changes their bodies go through, sex and how to negotiate uh, sexuality. And girls in particular, but boys too, wanted to be able to talk openly about sexual relationship. And girls wanted to be able to say no to unwanted sexual advances. And in these communities, a lot of the teenage pregnancies occurred through forced sex in which elder men would drag girls into the uh, shadows and um, and would coerce them into uh, unwanted sex, which would culminate in a, a teenage pregnancy. So the communities uh, had their plan about how they wanted to do these things. And the plan included uh, dialogue between parents and children, activities organized by peer educators who would develop their own messages. And this was important because young people talk to each other differently uh, than adults talk with, uh, with teenagers. And so they were spreading messages about the importance of using contraceptives. And the young people themselves often engaged in uh, public education and discussion uh, approaches such as uh, street dramas. And in one street drama, there were two different vignettes. In the first vignette, there were a boy and girl uh, shown and they felt an attraction and so they went to the video hall, uh, they smoked marijuana, drank beer, and afterwards had impromptu unprotected sex. 
And uh, the vignette went on to show the girl with the belly having morning sickness, uh, being very unhappy because she and her boyfriend had to drop out of school and uh, her life was very difficult thereafter. Then uh, the pair stopped and told the uh, community audience, now we wanna show a different way. So the second vignette showed the same boy and girl uh, feeling an attraction and then asking each other, what's our dream? And they said their dream was to complete their education, to start a family, to become, to, you know, to be good contributing uh, members of their village. So in this context, they started discussing, well, what's it gonna take to stay in school? Uh, we can't have a pregnancy, they said. And then uh, that led them to talk about the importance of contraception and a decision to actually use it. And uh, so they had begun discussing uh, 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 sexual relationships uh, openly and negotiating it. And that was quite different. Parents were actively discussing with uh, talking with children and encouraging their children uh, to stay in school. And uh, in the communities, messages were going out about the importance of avoiding teenage pregnancy and supporting people to stay, to stay in school. At the end of a year, uh, an evaluation was done that indicated that in the three communities where the, uh, that had taken community action, they, uh, the levels of teenage pregnancy had dropped significantly. Typically in a school year, there were three to six new teenage pregnancies, but in these communities, in two of them, there were zero new teenage pregnancies. In the other community, there was one teen pregnancy, but uh, it was uh, in a girl who had become pregnant outside of the community and who had then moved back into the village. And uh, in contrast, in matched comparison communities, there were the usual three to six pregnancies uh, in that same period of time. So this was a very, very promising outcome. But an equally important outcome was that this process of community mobilization, community empowerment, community activation from within led to such uh, powerful awareness uh, and watchfulness uh, with regard to children's sexual activity that it was no longer possible for elder men to draw girls into the shadows and to coerce them into, uh, into sex. So in other words, the rates of sex abuse against children went way down. Similar work in uh, Kenya and in India subsequently has confirmed that, uh, again, that this community-led process is very, very effective in addressing, uh, in reducing uh, sexual abuse uh, against girls and in some cases, boys. Well, at this point, you might be wondering, so if communities uh, uh, can solve their own problems, why do they need us? Here, there are two uh, important points to keep in mind. First of all, adults, whether in the US or in countries like uh, Sierra Leone, are oftentimes not adequately in touch with their children's lives. And they may not know everything that their children are thinking, feeling, and doing. And so sometimes we're just not uh, there and realizing uh, the magnitude of the problems they face or the particular um, uh, forms that the problems take. Secondly, adults, uh, societies have an unfortunate tendency to infantilize children. Most societies are adult-led and uh, oftentimes the view is that children should be seen but not heard. This is really unfortunate, you know, because uh, teenagers in particular have tremendous creativity and problem solving ability. We ought to be creating space that honors that and that gives them the opportunity uh, to develop approaches to uh, solve these problems. So I think that if uh, we as outsiders play a facilitative role, a co-learning role and a documenting role, documenting what communities do, then community problem solving comes into play children's leadership comes to the fore and the children are not set apart from communities as they are in children's clubs. In this whole community process I'm describing, they are the champions in which, uh, who help communities to solve, uh, to solve problems that were chosen by the community itself. So they're viewed as good community uh, agents. 
Well, I want to suggest that with regard to child sexual abuse, prevention ought to be our top priority. And that community problem solving and ownership is one of the keys to effective and sustainable prevention. So maybe in some small way in the future, you can do your part to help us all listen uh, better to communities and to children and to walk with alongside communities as they solve these problems and do their part to reduce and prevent the sexual abuse of children. Thanks very much. Successful engagement of faith communities in prevention and healing in today's session. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. This is my unique opportunity to welcome you and especially the organizer as well as all the participants, those who are to me exceptionally great as I am representing Royal Vision, let me start with Royal Vision mission statement with you first. Because Royal Vision mission and the purpose of this discussion or theme of this discussion is almost same. Our mission is to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in working with the poor and oppressed to promote human transformation seek justice and bear witness to the good news of the kingdom of God. In alignment with this mission, we Royal Vision are committed everywhere to engage faith communities into our ministry. Therefore, I am so excited to having this opportunity to uh, share how Royal Vision Bangladesh is working with the faith communities. In this purpose, we are engaging Islamic Foundation, which is one of the biggest organization under the umbrella of government of Bangladesh. All the churches without considering denomination, like Catholic Church, Baptist Church, all other denominations, and even all the faith-based organization like NGOs at national level, international level. So let me start with Royal Vision's approach and model. How Royal Vision is engaging faith communities into our program. We have two specific model. We call it channels of hope. The purpose is to work child protection issues. And second one is celebrating families. The purpose is to promote peace, harmony and justice at family level and community level. Then I love to share with you uh, about the COVID-19 and faith engagement as a success story. You know, pandemic was touched profoundly all our lives. Everybody was impacted and it was again unprecedented. And among them, children and women are suffered a lot because of the uh, financial crisis, because of school close down, because of lockdown, many other aspects. So in this situation, Royal Vision considered that we should raise awareness program massively all around the country. And in this plan, we considered, we have considered faith leaders can be the pioneer in the process of massive awareness program at the community level, at the national level. As you know that uh, Bangladesh is a densely populated country and particularly in the urban slums are so dense. And also if, if maybe you know the Rohingya refugee at Cox Bazar, they are also staying in a camp in a huge crowded as well as densely types of living. So these are some uh, point I'm uh, just telling you that those locations are seriously concerned. As a result, we thought how at Cox level or national level and field level or village level, faith leaders can be the pioneer role player with some specific masses and some action item 
to rescue, to save, to protect the community people. So for that reason, World Vision selected 2,464 faith leaders, including few community leaders, and trained them on specific COVID-19 related messages, along with some tools, particularly leaflet handouts, so that they can go to the community with a proper guidance so that community can get right message. Same time, we have also arranged two television talk show for massive awareness raising by engaging four religious leaders. One is from Christian, Muslim, Buddhist and Hindu. So that people can see the role of faith across the country is a togetherness for the common purpose. So that is another exciting story. And finally, I would say we have arranged 13 webinars across the country for church leaders. So that church leaders, wherever they are staying at the community, they can carry out their job independently within their community level. So in this process, World Vision Bangladesh was able to reach 398,550 population or person through this messaging or say awareness raising program. And if you asked me what is the learning during this COVID while we was engaging faith leaders. First learning I can say because of faith leaders engagement during this situation, particularly the pandemic situation, they have earned credibility, respect by the community people. Because whenever faith leaders stand beside the most vulnerable communities, they feel trust and they see faith leaders are the right people to talk with them, guide with them, guide for them, everything. So that is a common uh, environment in Bangladesh. And secondly, while they found some of the sick people, they also prayed at home, at community, and also they gave some psychosocial motivation, orientation. And not only that, they even gave some material support. So these are some significant learning how faith leaders contributed during this pandemic time. In addition, during the uh, Friday mosque prayer, many of the faith leaders uh, took the initiative uh, as a khutbah, we call it messaging to the devotees who are attending in the mosque. I can mention two or three names here. Maulana Gulam Mustafa. He is one of the prominent leader, Imam in the mosque and Madrasha. He played a significant role. Uh, Usman Gomi, Goni, who is one of the Imam and is an Islamic scholar, he was writing regular article as well as he was playing, uh, communicating, networking with all the faith leaders. Archbishop Bijoy D. Cruz, who is the uh, leader of the whole Christian community. He was significantly playing a strong role in this situation. So that was the situation of COVID-19 response and engagement of faith leaders. Now let me share one exciting another example with you. Royal Vision leading one campaign called It Takes Me to End Physical Violence Against Children at Home, Schools and in the community or workplace. In this campaign, the focus is to prevent, protect and give support healing to the victims of particularly the children and women. Along with this approach, we are engaging huge number of faith leaders. Maybe you can ask why faith leaders or why this program? Because you know, Bangladesh, uh, the physical violence against children, Bangladesh has remarkable 
high numbers and particularly if I mention few numbers only with you, 87.7% of the nation's children face domestic violence at home. 42% face sexual abuse before they turn the age of 14, which is another alarming area of concern. 64% particularly the children face physical violence in different ways. In terms of child marriage, Bangladesh is now positioned at the fourth position across the whole globe. And during the pandemic, it increases significantly, and which is one of the violation on the rights of children. So considering all those points, World Vision strongly and robustly leading this campaign across the whole country. And we are engaging faith communities apart from many other stakeholders. So this campaign started in 2018. So let me give you one just uh, uh, statistical information. In 2018, we have 4,971 faith leaders who was engaged in this process. And we have trained them, orient them, and regularly having meeting with them so that they can send or disseminate the message in a right way at their level. And community can get connection with them. So it is a bridging between community and the faith leaders very strongly with the correct message. In 2019, Almost 8,037 faith leaders was again oriented and trained and gave some tools and techniques for their right message, particularly violation against children, child marriage, and there are a lot of stories I can share, but because of the time, it is not possible. But you will be amazed to see their contribution at the field level. And 2020, despite of COVID, uh, almost 3,930 faith leaders was engaged with us and they are now continuing their role at the community level. These are some out of many works uh, I can share with you that how successfully faith leaders are working at the community level with their regular responsibility and also uh, the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, now you may ha you may ask me, so what? You are doing excellent job, so what? That is the right question, maybe. Let me share with you some exciting, not story, but few statements. First of all, according to our observation and sharing with the faith leaders, they said they gained increased knowledge and skill to address violence against children in alignment with the CRC. So that is number one in their life, particularly I can say how they are changing and learning. Second, faith leaders promo promoted their positive values and behaviors and they demonstrated it at the family level. So positiveness of their mindset, attitude is a matter for them. And again, faith leaders also feels this is the their value adding role to play in the pandemic along with their spiritual or religious role to play in the community. So they are considered as a role player now. And again, they carried out preaching regularly with all those new knowledge and skills and statistics, particularly during uh, mosque prayer and on Friday during the khutbah when they disseminate even they arrange small small gathering or meeting during that time they shared it they visit house to house they can share it is not only talking the Muslim faith if it's all about Christian faith all about Muslim Hindus Buddha. again let me give you one example I'm almost done now four separate uh, religious leaders easily can say we are no more separate we are together we are sitting together we are learning together 
and we are serving together for the whole community. It's a holistic, it's a transformative approach. In our country, say Dada is a Hindu address or greet. When we say bye, it's a again brother, but language is different, word is different. So nowadays, everybody is using same word. It's say bye or Dada, whenever we are meeting together, it's openly we are saying the common language. So that is another exciting example. So as a whole, it's a multi-dimensional impact. Engagement of the faith leaders into the program, it was a multi-dimensional. And they said, World Vision is the only organization who are bringing all organization or the faith leaders together in a very systematic way. And it is not a one event, it's a continuous process. I can once again thanks everyone, particularly the organizer and the audiences and those who are virtually listening this message i know you may have so many questions please connect with the organizer so that we can talk more in the future once again thank you and see you in the future sometime thank you thank you. good day my name is father rick bauer i'm a roman catholic priest with the marino fathers and brothers I'm also a board certified chaplain through the National Association of Catholic Chaplains and a licensed clinical social worker. I'm currently serving as the director of spiritual and psychosocial support for the Eastern Deanery AIDS Relief Program or EDARP, a large faith-based organization providing care, support and treatment for persons with HIV and TB in the Archdiocese of Nairobi. I would like to sincerely thank the organizers for this great opportunity to present some of our strategies for prevention and healing for children who have experienced violence and abuse. We're located, as I said, in Kenya, the eastern part of Africa, and our 14 clinics are located in the eastern part, mostly the slum areas of Nairobi. Here's an example of one of our typical clinics and the slum areas that we have to work in. This is a difficult area to do any kind of public health intervention and was exacerbated by the COVID pandemic which greatly impacted even more the economic well-being of many of these per, many of these slum dwellers. EDAR began in 1993, and we started providing antiretroviral therapy for HIV in 2004. We currently operate over 14 clinics with almost 30,000 HIV positive clients, including over 2,000 HIV positive children and adults. We have 420 staff members and of utmost important, over 1,100 community health workers that provide that bridge between community-based services and clinic-based services. We offer a comprehensive HIV and TB assessment and treatment and are focusing on differentiated treatment to try to meet the unique needs of every person for their health and well being. Most recently, we have had a renewed focus on both identifying and supporting those who have experienced gender based violence and support for children who have experienced abuse and neglect. When I arrived over three years ago to EDARP, I realized that there was no harassment policy for staff and community health workers. There was no explicit policies and procedures for the identification and support of patients who had experienced gender-based violence. And there was no child safeguarding or child protection policies and procedures in the organization. I did not expect any problems or suspect any problems, but these were three important areas that we needed to rectify. So I brought this to the senior management and the boards for support on the way forward. We all acknowledge that abuse and neglect within the communities are widespread. And so after consultation with the experts at Catholic Community Services, as well as stitching Porticus, 
we began to develop and implement an HR policy on staff harassment and abuse. We acknowledged the complex co-relationships between violence, gender-based violence, child abuse and neglect, and substance abuse. We began with an organizational-wide training on identifying and supporting those who have experienced gender-based violence, mainly adults, including staff and community health workers. We then developed awareness and education on both child safeguarding and child protection policies and procedures, and are currently developing an evidence-based low literacy intervention for those who experience problems with substance abuse. In the development of our child safeguarding and child protection awareness policies and procedures, we had to develop policies and procedures for all of those receiving care and clinical services at our 14 community clinics, as well as those receiving services by our community health workers and clinical staff within the communities. We had to develop and enhance the clinical expertise, as well as the policies and procedures to identify children who may be experiencing abuse and neglect. We had to develop community outreach and education so that we weren't doing this alone, but in consort with our communities that we have great trust and social capital with, especially our communities of faith in our catchment areas. And we had to improve and maintain relationships and mutual support between EDARP as well as justice systems, both traditional and governmental. So we began with an awareness and training to identify and support those, mainly adults who have experienced gender-based violence. This included introduction, terminology, definitions, understanding the situation and the context of gender-based violence, and understanding the impact of gender-based violence, particularly on children. We had to acknowledge myths and facts about gender-based violence, understand gender-based violence and Kenyan law, and then boost the quality of our clinical management, both for mental health as well as the physical care of the gender-based violence survivor. We had to learn how to document GBV services and referrals. And again, I wanna emphasize this was not only physical care, but psychosocial and spiritual support about being present to those who have experienced gender-based violence. Equally as important, we had to include staff support and debriefing in this process. We then began with the process to develop why we need child safeguarding and protection standards. And I greatly utilize the fantastic resource and website of Keeping Children Safe. We had to discuss why these standards and guiding principles for implementation, especially our spiritual and theological roots. We had to acknowledge how we'll work with each other and our many partners. We had to acknowledge the advantages of having child safeguarding policies, develop the actual policy, and to develop clear expectations of our staff and community health workers. We needed to develop policies and procedures to maximize a child safe environment across all of EDARP services, both in the clinics as well in the community. And then to develop systems of accountability of how EDARP will monitor and review these measures. And so working with senior management and key staff members, we developed and implemented a self-assessment tool for each clinical site to look at our risks in keeping children safe. We developed a code of conduct for all staff, volunteers, and the many temporary personnel that often provide services and our work and mission for people with HIV. We needed to develop and implement an EDARP policy and procedures on child safeguarding and to develop those clinical protocols for the identification of children 
who may have been abused or neglected, and the additional forensic training for key clinical staff members. We then developed a community workshop on child safeguarding for community leaders, especially faith leaders, so that we were not doing this alone, but doing this in, in consort with the many communities that we operate in. The community workshop on child safeguarding taught about the basic facts, definitions, and the negative effects of child abuse and violence, learning about evidence-based programs to prevent child abuse, minimize the opportunities for abuse, abusers and perpetrators to exploit children, both in our clinical settings, as well as in the community, particularly our faith communities, our churches, mosques, and temples. And then to react responsibly and consistently to any allegations of abuse or violence against children. We taught our staff and our community leaders to use their leadership to change the conver conversation about violence against children and to use our leadership to change the course of violence. What we learned is that we have to develop not only the policies and procedures, but the important change in collective responsibility to change attitudes and awareness. We must acknowledge that a significant proportion of our staff have themselves experienced gender-based violence or violence as a child. And these staff have to be acknowledged and supported and provided the confidential additional support and counseling if they so wish. We acknowledge that child safeguarding and child protection is not a once-off training, but a change in the organizational culture and the constant need for monitoring, evaluation, and updating. We need to acknowledge and understand all forms of abuse, the physical, the emotional, the neglect, and spiritual abuse that can occur in our faith communities. We need to train both our mental health workers, our social workers and counselors, and our physicians and nurses on the complex evaluation and response to child abuse and neglect. And we need to develop evidence-based substance abuse prevention and treatment. I used many of these important resources particularly those that focus on our, why we're doing this from spiritual and theological roots. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to our dialogue in the sessions, or you can always feel free to email me at the email below. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present, and I'm very grateful for each one that has listened to this and to be able to present what we have done in Nairobi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Frederike Seidel, and I work for the World Council of Churches. The WCC is a fellowship representing about half a billion Christians through its member churches in 120 countries. As you know, for many children worldwide, churches represent a shelter a safe haven, a guiding light in the midst of challenging times. I've witnessed this myself on many occasions in many ways. And this is why in 2013, we have been asked by member churches at the WCC's General Assembly to support them in their efforts for children and with children. In 2015, we have thus launched the partnership with UNICEF and we led a large consultative process on the question, how can churches best use their influence to improve children's lives? This discussion was led with member churches, but also with child rights experts and many partners of other organizations. After 18 months, a consensus was achieved between the member churches on this question and an action plan was approved by the WCC's executive committee. This action plan was called the Church's Commitments to Children, and it was launched through an invitation by the General Secretary of the WCC, 
to all its 350 churches, asking them to consider making these commitments their own. There was an overwhelming positive response to this invitation. And today we have over 2000 supporters worldwide collaborating in the implementation of the church's commitments to children. Resources are shared with them in about 120 countries. Now, what exactly are the church's commitments to children? This action plan has three main pillars. The actions of pillar one are all about churches promoting child protection. The second pillar is about churches promoting meaningful child participation, both within the churches and in society at large. And the third pillar is about concrete actions for climate justice, both with and for children. Now, let me share with you more details about Commitment 1A. In fact, in the invitation to all the churches, it was made very clear that any church not yet having a child safeguarding policy should really focus on this Commitment 1A before engaging in any further activities with children. This commitment is about prioritizing the development and solid implementation of a child safeguarding policy, which must include appropriate recruitment practices and a child-friendly code of conduct. This commitment is about securing confidential reporting about any suspicion of child abuse and appropriate and confidential support for victims of child sexual abuse. Special attention must be given to the protection of children with disabilities. And so this commitment is really about capacity building for all on preventive measures and responses to child sexual abuse. Then there is commitment 1B, and this is about the role of churches in ending violence against children in society at large. This part of the action plan includes a lot of projects about ending harmful traditional practices, including, for example, female genital mutilation, early marriage, and gender-based violence. This part of the action plan is about churches advocating with authorities requesting that they provide services to protect children from violence. It is about churches promoting nonviolent discipline of children and support for positive parenting, which is very important in the prevention of violence against children and child sexual abuse. Because of the overwhelming positive responses of churches, we were helped by UNICEF to develop an online platform which allows for mutual support among the churches and among churches and partners around the implementation of all of the commitments. Here you can look up, for example, which are the churches which are particularly engaged in certain aspects of the commitments and which ones are seeking support to ensure solid implementation. It is so important for churches and other faith partners to work together in this effort. We had a very strong momentum in December where UNICEF in, in Europe has initiated an online platform which brought together partners from many faiths for the protection of children on the move. And of course, in the context of migration, the risk of child sexual abuse is so much higher than anywhere else. So it was very good to see that it's possible to share good practices and that there is then a dynamic of really um, accelerating the responses and ensuring that people do not have to start from the scratch but can consider adapting good practices which were already tested and scaling these up. Now, what can the support and collaboration between churches and partners look like? An example is from 
the Church of England, a very particular campaign which helps to address modern slavery. And this was so successful in the UK that we are now exploring how it could be scaled up internationally and support churches in the efforts to end child modern slavery. At the moment, we are looking into this with our churches in Italy, Tanzania, and Ghana, and looking at ways that what has been developed and tested in the UK context could become very relevant for the efforts of churches underway in different countries for the response to child modern slavery, which in many cases also includes child sexual abuse. In 2019, we were very blessed to receive support from Ignite Philanthropy for the commitments 1A and 1B. You may be familiar with the Out of the Shadows Index. It was developed by the Economist Intelligence Unit and it shares data on a very large number of countries to see what the situation there is like with regards to the prevention efforts and responses to child sexual abuse. So we developed a strategy to support the churches in translating into action the findings and recommendations from the Out of the Shadows Index. This was started through capacity, work, capacity building workshops in a number of pilot countries, both in Africa and in Asia. And in these capacity building workshops, church leaders and child rights experts have developed together action plans to support the governments in their efforts to end child sexual abuse across their countries. Based on the recommendations from these capacity building workshops, we have also developed a toolkit for all churches world, worldwide, which can help them in their efforts for prevention and response to child sexual abuse. For example, you will find in this toolkit templates, which are for posters that should be available in all church buildings, also in church-run schools, in order to make sure that any child coming to a church finds out about the toll-free child helplines available in their countries. We also have developed posters aimed at adults, as the child helplines can be very useful also for parents and any adults who seek help for the prevention of child sexual abuse. Our toolkit also contains spiritual life resources. So this is a compilation of Bible studies, prayers and songs, which have been put together especially in the view to support the churches at community level in their prevention and response efforts to stop child sexual abuse. And today I'm particularly happy that we have just received further support from IGNITE for a phase two of the Out of the Shadows campaign for churches. In this second phase, we are also including a component in which we share resources to address the climate related prevalence of child sexual abuse. As there's more and more evidence that with the increase of consequences of global warming, the prevalence of child sexual abuse is increasing. So we are urging all the churches engaged in the church's commitments to children to look at the existing solutions which anyone can engage with and incorporate into their measures activities which help to address the climate crisis. I would like to encourage all of you to consider looking up our webpage where you will find all the resources which we make available for those who would like to help in the implementation of churches' commitments to children. You can also write to us and request the templates of some of the materials of the Out of the Shadows campaign if you would like to consider tailoring it to your own church or country context. 
I would like to say a very big thanks to the Howard Flourishing Program for organizing this symposium. As it is so important for all of us to work together in our efforts to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse. Thank you very, very much to everyone involved, and I look forward to our collaboration.